John. Hello. Do we pick up where we left off? My goodness. Uh, I, uh, the, the word create, uh, creativity has come up a few times during the course of the day, and, and there's really very, very few people in fashion who define it as beautifully as John does and has in his career. I mean, if we just look at that right there, from your very first artisanal collection for Margiela, where you create an Archimboldo face on a dress. And just that, that single image to me just... There's, there's such a weight of, of history, culture, fashion. I mean, there's so much in that. Uh, it seems like a good place to start talking about your process because uh, we've never had an opportunity to do that in public. And I want to know how something like that happens. Um, well, something like that. That's, um, that collection was called Intentions and it was to help me establish a building blocks of where I would like to nudge Maison Margiela in, in, into which direction. Um, and it seemed relevant, modern, um, and part of the DNA of the house, finding found objects, seashells, which I had started to collect in um, Los Angeles and Normandy, and then one of my assistants, his mother's a chef, and she had kept her muscles, and so, Hello. <laughs> um, and that was my proposal of a kind of bold embroidery for Margiela. In fact, I've just come from Paris, and this is um, a pretty creative time for me at the moment because I'm working on the new artisanal collection. Um, and that's a really exciting time. Um, and it's great there. I mean, I feel much freer, my, my, my points of inspiration are, are much freer. Um, Why do you and think also it's a, it's a smaller team as well, so I'm able to work with um, a lot of students that come and do stage, uh, student placements with us. Um, and being a smaller team, they're very much involved in the whole process from A to Z, so they get to experience the fittings with me. I mean, I just came the other day. Can I tell you about Paulina? gorgeous little girl that I discovered on Instagram because I have new muses who I call Instagram babes and Paulina is one of them and she has this amazing line and she's posting these amazing pictures full of emotion. I mean, I can see the references coming from Basquiat but she's taken it to another level. Um, she's a young adult. I mean, she's a child, a child, really. And um, she's so inspiring and... Um, you know, she colours her hair, it's turquoise, it's pink, it's yellow, it's blue, and it's getting shorter and shorter. It's chemical crop at the moment. Um, and she's really colourful, and it's, uh, her jumpers are all dashy red, and with what's left, she creates a kind of boa. And I felt like a, a connection there. I mean, I could see the hope in her eyes, the determination. Um, you know, when you work with these young adults as well, sometimes I forget, and I, and I think they're like my assistants, so I really do involve them in the process. And there was this great dress up. Well, it will be great, I hope. I got her involved, and I was, it was kind of... Um, I'm having another go at the bias cutting because I feel ready to have a go at that again. And, <clears throat> and I started to spin out a narrative because, I mean, I like to tell stories to, to, to inspire the people. I, I don't say them outside anymore. Um, I keep them in-house, but it still inspires m my teams. Because your stories used to be like movie scripts. I mean, the story <laughs> Yeah, they became the quite, um, yeah, yeah. quite detailed. Well, it was just great to know who the, the woman is. Um, so there's Paulina, and I'm talking her through this dress and how I, you know, and it's about a, a lost love. It's a transatlantic love. And, um, and I'm thinking of crocheting it together and I've got Joan Baez's music in the background, so she's kicking off in my head. And, um, and I'm trying to communicate with this child. Um, and she's just looking straight at me, almost like she's getting it, you know? And I said, you know, it's a long transatlantic love, you know, moonlight, and you pick up a biro, and you start to write notes on your arm. Where would you start writing the notes? Because, you know, I'm done with classical placements for embroideries. 
And she said, oh, I totally get it. I totally relate. I was like, really? So yeah, <laughs> me and my boyfriend tattoo each other. I went, genius, get upstairs, get on with it, and I'll see you on Tuesday. <laughs> Total connection. I mean, like, amazing. I never had that connection before. I mean, um, the students were kept on a separate floor in a you know, different room. And these guys I'm working with now are great. I mean, um, I mean, I still ask them to make teas and coffees and arrange a nice plateau, because <laughs> that's important too, and the photocop, that, that is important. Um, but they do get, you know, a little opportunity to get involved in a outfit number 17 or whatever do it's Do you think be. that's the nature of the house? Or do you think that's a, that reflects a change in you? Both. The openness, the, I the think, hunger I think, for freedom. Yeah, it's where I am today, how I'm feeling today. Um, <clears throat> and um, yeah, I just feel much freer in, in this uh, equation, if you like, yeah. Uh, you just slipped something in there a little while ago, and I'm not gonna <coughs> let it go. What on earth do you have left to do with the bias cut? I thought you'd pretty well, <laughs> well said no, that No, because every say. time I do it, right, well, I found a way to do it for day at Maison Margiela. So I started playing around with tweeds on the butt. I just, every time I did it, it looked like old Galliano, do you know what I mean? I thought, well, I can't bring that to Maison Margiela because it's just not on. You, you can't do that. So I kind of put it down for a bit. And I've been working on different weaves of fabrics and just actually trying to produce the bias for day doing it with wools and tweeds, and less of that satin back crepe and silks of the 90s, which was totally relevant then, of course. So trying to do it in a, just a cooler way, um, I don't know if it's gonna work, but we're trying. Um, so what does that say, could about, be fun. To, what does it could say be fun. about today? Like tweed on the bias that you think is right for now, where satin back crepe was right for the 90s. Why is tweed on the bias right for now? It just. Um, well, it's, it's one of my signature cuts, and I think um, it's a shame not to exploit it, but I want to do it in a way that's relevant for the house, for Maison Magella. And it seemed that playing with masculine fabrics and tweeds just opened up a whole different way of looking at the bias. Um, and it, it, I, I just feel that it could be um, a nice way. Uh, where Mata Magella's work and my work synthesize in quite a beautiful way. Um, we'll see. Do you, do you, have you found uh, uh, an innate compatibility while you've been working at Maison Magella between what Martin was doing and what, what you uh, want to do? Uh, absolutely. Well, yes. Um, I mean, uh, I went into the archives, you know, I was really excited to, but I didn't want to, um, I'm not there to curate Martin Magella. I and mean, we had a discussion with Martin and he was uh, d'accord with me, but to understand the psychology behind it um, and then to use that as a springboard for going forward. Um, so I did study the cuts and tried to take myself back, and, I, and it was quite easy for me to go back into that period, that kind of 80s when I was in London, and we were all turning things inside out and upside down and uh, discovering the in arts of tailoring. It's how we, how we learn, we deconstructed to then construct something beautiful. So that was fine, I didn't have, it was more the next step now, now where do you want to take this now? Um, as I said, I don't want to get pushed into a corner of just curating or like at Galliano, just known for producing bias cut dresses, because I did do other things. <laughs> or at Dior, the Dior bar jacket, again, I did do other things. So one has to be careful uh, and keep those options open um, until, you know, the buyers kind of understand where you're trying to go and uh, take the brand. The pyramidical way of working is something that um, I like. Um, this is artisanal too, and shows the process. Um, I mean, this is a good way to come into Matan psychology, if you like, too. Uh, I call it the anonymity of the lining. Uh, just when you thought you could do everything with a lining, we further studied. And um, I love the idea, well, it's a coat. And um, you see the lining, that you can pull the coat off and you actually wear the lining as a dress, you can step into it. So what was the lining becomes the dress. Um, and this is an idea that, you develop in artisanal that then... This is something that was developed into the art. Yeah, well, I thought it was kind of a 
in an anonymous way, it was a branding as strong as a Chanel button or LVMH logo. I needed that. I felt the house needed that, but I couldn't do it that way. I didn't want to do it that way. And I felt that, you know, yeah, from across the road, if a lady, you know, or at a part took a jacket off, wore it back like that, you'd know it was kind of from Maison Margiela. Um, so that has often uh, inspired, influenced um, uh, the ready to wear. Um, this was another moment. Try I love um, this one I called Unconscious Glamour. Um, and we had a, a muse here. And she was called Madame Le Pigeon. So I wrote her, I got into it like an actor gets into the character, and, it, and she took me places. Um, but just that, that idea that the park bench had just been freshly painted, it could be Hyde Park or Le Tuileries. Um, she's wearing a bit of a bias cut skirt in tweed there as well. Um, it must have been bubbling. And she sits on the bench and gets up and walks away, and she's got the, the, the paint marks which I thought was just so glamorous and so modern. Um, Why? I, just the way she looks. I mean, the that, randomness uh, of it, I love. Uh, 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 just that's what I was feeling. That's, that's what I felt. That's the unconscious glamour, the totally. idea. Totally. I mean, there were other stories. She had a little makeup mirror that was cracked, and then that turned into an embroidery in the ready-to-wear and, and so on. Um, and so on. I find the, sport, the story in-house um, inspires the team, um, you know, it's, it's nice to know who she is, or he is. That's the cracked mirror compact that then became a dress that we layered over things. Um, and that's do you, my do you think that, um, that, that a lot of this is the fact that you've, you've, you've acquired such an, an accomplished vocabulary in creating clothing that as you get older, it's like you, you see it with a lot of artists that they can gradually take apart what they did because they know it so well, they're able to unpick it and, and create a new language that is based on, in a way, destroying the old language. Do you feel that that is, in a sense, what you're, what you're able to explore at Maison Margiela? Yeah, especially the fittings. I mean, because I, I, I introduced the atelier and the petit man and, uh, and that way of working, because. Um, you know, being able to produce volumes is, is what fashion is about. And sometimes in Ready to Wear, there just isn't that time. So for me, working this way is really good because I can create those volumes. Sorry, what was your question? I forgot. No, it's just that, it's just that uh, do, you find, do you feel that? Oh, that I know what you were saying, yes. Absolutely, and I find myself doing it in one. the fittings too, because when I first went there, I was cleaning everything up and everything, you know. <gasps> And, and Vanessa, who I've worked with for about 25 years, would kick me and say, you're going too far, you're going too far. I said, well, I'm trying to flatter. She went, no, loosen up, loosen up. Like, so I do the whole fitting like the way I used to, and they say, look, guys, I'm really sorry, but we have to do this again tomorrow. And then I'd come in and start ripping things apart, and just the fitting had to be cool as well. How does it feel to wear Maison Margiela today? Um, and that was really interesting to, to, and I'm still going through that. That's a whole new uh, exploration, a new language that I'm, I'm kind of learning. And what, where, now. Where, where, are, where, where are you in that process? Because that's fascinating. Still ongoing. Still. Yeah. Do you feel pretty much. there's this interesting, interesting thing about this kind of creativity? In, as the world goes in one direction towards a much more prosaic and pragmatic um, state of mind. It seems to me the other direction can flourish as well, where creativity has almost to. takes on this sort of It has to. Where way. can we be without sensing the emotion of the cup, bless you, or a frill, or, you know, if you don't sense that, I mean, you can only decline so much, and then you're declining what? We need the parfum. We need the essence the undiluted creativity, which is artisanal. Only then, I feel, can we exploit that into the ready-to-wear, or the eau de toilette, or the eau de parfum, and so on and so on, right down through to the accessories. You'll see the, not on this slide, you won't, on the next, maybe. You'll see... Um, there, there, there it is, there's the bag. Oh, is there a bag? There. Yes, there is. Yeah. The anonymity of the lining, that concept, runs right through to all the accessories. Um, 
success needs coherence of a brand. And these are some ready to wear examples. Uh, the chiffon blouse, that's actually the lining now, the lining's cut in chiffon or georgette to look like a blouse. You can still wear the jacket off your shoulders. So. With, with the, um, working in this new way for you, working with a smaller team and much freer, do you feel the, the weight of technology now in a way you didn't? Do you feel, you know, the digital era kind of shadowing you when you're... Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm much more in touch with the real world today than I ever was, for sure, especially surrounded by my kids. Um, and, you know, the sensibility of, you know, I talked about um, uh, traditional compositions of, 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 uh, of, for an embroidery or something, and Paulina comes along and starts talking emojis and plays, you know, symbols to Snapchat, and I'm like, go on. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, this is like so right. This is how people communicate today, John. Let's take that on board in this crochet embroidered dress. So, absolutely. It's good I'm, Snapchat, isn't it? I mean, oh, I, 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 can't, I, I can't do it. <laughs> Those things bug me a bit. And then you, but do then you, you use go it? to. No, I don't. I do Instagram. I do quite like Instagram. But then you go to Kyoto. To, to, yes. have these, to have these notions I, created in these incredibly arcane techniques, which brings well, together the old world and the new world. Craftsmanship. That was, sorry, just to go back to that point, the, uh, um, the glamour, that unconscious glamour, that was its influence um, on the ready-to-wear and the, all these lovely bright colours and bonded fabrics um, with a kind of eastern sensibility in print. Um, yeah, I, I, I still... I still kept in touch with um, many artisans from all over the world, and uh, it's, it's a great way of working at Maison Margiela because there's always a cross-pollination and a search for authenticity. So I come to England for my tweets or my rubber Macintosh fabric. Um, yes, we went to Kyoto for uh, the master Kyoto artist there who did a, it's a discharge print, which they do by hand, so they take all the color out, um, and then I asked them to paint an embroidery back in. <laughs> What's the bit you like the most? Uh, the process. I, I, I love working with my team. Um, the, the, I, the process is the most exciting because it's, um, uh, you just never know which, how the day is going to turn out. It's, you know, the surprises. Um, Has it always that been? That was a surprise. Sorry, Tim, to interrupt, but that's, no, that's really fine, interesting to talk about that one. That's called a glitch. Well, I didn't know what a glitch was until I read it in the press release backstage at Maison Margiela. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Ed called it a glitch. I was like, wow. But it was for real, because Bark, one of my young kids, um, I was like preparing some work for Pat McGrath. And Ma no, I wasn't. I, I was preparing some work for college. Or whatever. It did inspire Pat later. And um, this happened. I went, oh, how did that happen? That climb blue and this torn edge, it's like a collage. He said, oh, I don't know, I don't know. I said, well, make it happen again. And he couldn't, he tried and he tried and, you know. And then you get a glitch app. It's not the same, though. That was real. And at that time, that just very noble act of tearing paper, the emotion of tearing paper. Um, was this it is something always, I did. Was it always like that? Well, Or was that, that kind of happy accident? Or, or oh, are, you I more, are you more open to them now that once upon a time you would have tried to make I it perfect? I think I'm more open to them, to them now, a little bit braver maybe. Um, yeah, no, I'm more open to them now for sure. I mean, that was me throwing bleach over a coat and it was just trying to discover different ways of creating this emotion of something that's torn. Uh, Rip to reveal, I called it. And as the collection progressed, the first girls came out in toile and paper patterns. And then as you ripped the paper away, you started to reveal the very sumptuous fabrics. And that's one of the processes. And it goes on and on and on. And then at the end, she was in full color and brocade. And Do you think you've embraced imperfection, maybe in a way that, that you never did before? Yes. I think I, I did before. But now I, 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 um... You're more comfortable with chaos? Uh, maybe. 
maybe, yeah, maybe. Um, I don't know, perfection is quite, when I used to think I had to be perfect, it's actually quite limiting, and I realize now that only God can produce perfection, and that he imperfection. He makes awful mistakes. So. Ah. <laughs> Let's talk about that later. If you're, talking, <laughs> if you're talking about the state of the world, it's not God's fault, it's our fucking fault, all right? But I don't know if you're going there. Sorry, Where you? what was I talking about? <laughs> See, I was second guessing you. Um, Comfortable with chaos. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, well, no, I was saying about perfection and God, and I just now realize that imperfection actually gives me much, many more possibilities and avenues to travel down. And um, it's that self-willing that I used to do all the time is just not appropriate. And it doesn't work for me now. Um, so I leave things a bit more open. Like, you know, like I said about the fitting, I'll come back. That's the great thing about artisanal too. I, I can go home relatively early and think about what I did that day and then come back and, actually, and, and say, well, actually, it was wrong. Whereas before, it just had to be right and it was already being cut before I'd finished my last remarks on the toile and it was then gone to industry, you know? So it's really important to have that artisanal, I think, really important. Do you think it, it's different? Do you think it makes a difference that it is... <clears throat> Maison Margiela, that in that house, you, do you feel in a way it's almost like a performance, that you're performing Maison Margiela, so you can, you can, you know, you said before that you, you didn't want to do something that was John No, Galliano. I don't feel it's a performance, I can't work when it's just a, perf I have to feel it, um, I talked about authenticity, your team knows when you're not being authentic, mm-mm, they'll pull me up, mm-mm, no. Um, it's not a performance. Um, when you're cutting or draping, um, they've seen me do enough of it to know when it's authentic. And it's uh, authentic to you? To all? And to, to Marjella and to all the kids you're working with? Yeah, I like, I like to think so. I mean, I'm not yet in my full stride at Maison Margiela. Um, God, what do you think that will look like? <clears throat> I'm not a prophet, I don't know. but. Um, all I can say is that I'm, I'm much more in the moment, you know, so I'm just trying to do the best that I can today um, and leave a lot of options open, especially with buyers around the world who are still quizzical to see where I am taking the house. Um, and that takes a bit of time, as, as you know. As I, you I know. love it that you, you <clears throat> when you talk about it as work, it seems like, it, it, authenticity, a, a very sort of honest labour to you and, you, and you come in your work coat, your white work coat. Well, this is authentic. This yes, is, um, absolutely. Yeah, this is what we wear, um, the white coat. Um, it's what the, uh, the premieres, um, the petit main, um, it's, what, it's what you wear to work, and I wear it at work. And everybody does who works Yes, them, everybody wears maison. it, yeah, yeah. Or look a bit like mad scientists or doctors or run away from mental home. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but it, do you know what? It's great because you commute. Before, sometimes I could be quite unsettled in a fitting because some, some fabulous girl would walk in and she'd be wearing a, a vintage Galliano from, I don't know, 83. And it, it would break the concentration. And now what's fab, I've, I've noticed, is that you, your, your communication is much pure in a way, and then you go down to the shoes, because that's where they express themselves, the girls and the boys now, isn't it? The colour socks or stockings or shoes, and so that's really interesting to Why, see. Why, what's going on down there? Well, they express themselves in colour or sheer or it's, yeah. Um, but you don't have to wear the coat, it's not an obligation, but um, to respect Mata Majella, we do. Uh, Lee Adelcourt made a very good point when, um, Sorry? Uh, Lee, when Lee, who spoke earlier this afternoon, made a very interesting point about how it was old-fashioned of fashion to elevate the individual when um, she was ta talking about the, this sort of a group ethos, a creative group ethos, you, that you work at Maison Margiela, you, uh, the white coats create this sort of uniform, you talk about your team, it feels very much like you feel 
like you are part of a group making something, that you're not the sort of tortured individual isolated in a tower, that you're very much on the floor with the team. It feels very democratic or even socialist. Um, I'm, well, I don't believe that you can create a collection. Um, sorry, by democracy, I really don't. Someone at the end of the day has to say, this is cool, this is shit. A lot of people aren't brave enough to do that, so that is my job to act. Someone has to make that decision. Of course, we all work on it together, but I'm the one that has to say, well, I feel this is the way we want to, you know, should be going, or this does express it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it, 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 it does, but I also feel that you're more agreeable to... Agreeable. <laughs> to, a, to a, you know, stuff that's coming in from other people. Oh, absolutely. Maybe you'll Absol take it all But that, I think also, Yes, that's where I am today. And I think also it's the layout of the studio is much more open than the more traditional houses. And um, because the teams are smaller, there's less kind of um, people that you have to go through. So I can walk into my fittings with a gang of kids and it's just great. Um, it's great. Where do you draw all the... Because your collections are so multi-layered. I mean, when you see them for eight minutes on a catwalk, it, it's impossible to take in everything that you're looking at because every single surface is textured or, or, or printed or detailed in some way. Um, the last collection, for example, the surf element in it was, was a surprise. Um, because, it, like I said before, you have the artisans in Kyoto um, using ancient techniques to create very, very modern effects. And where are you still pulling in well, all, that, your, all your Well, that collection you just mentioned was kind of a, how we were feeling in Paris, um, that last artisanal. Um, and you mentioned surfer boys and skateboarders because I, I have a great admiration for them because they have to stay in the present. Um, whatever tricks they're doing, goofy tops or waves they're riding, they have to stay in the present, otherwise they're dead. Um, and at the time, there was all that violence going on in Paris, and I felt like I wanted to return to historical in inspiration, and, and my mind went back to when I was a student, and I'd taken great inspiration from the French Revolution, which is kind of what was going on in Paris. And at the time, seeing what we were seeing, you know, cars exploding and fires, and, um, and I like the idea of taking that inspiration, but then reducing it to a silhouette. So imagine like a Victorian portrait, if you like. When you saw it, you felt it was a, a, a French revolutionary type. But then when you colored it, it was a skateboarder. I know we have some cutouts that might help me to understand. Well, oh, that's an Instagram, babe. And then I started to collage Victorian, but in plastics and things. Um, that's another anonymity of the lining. Well, that's one piece. So that was um, the collection I'm actually talking about now. Like there was surf, um, and what else was there in the... Well, in the there, uh, he, um, there was surf in this one. It was more skateboarding in, in the other one, where you can see through the colours. Um, I just love I that polyglot effect. You know, you, you're looking at... You're looking at so many times and places just collided in one, in, one, in one garment, in one look. I like the scuba boots, the tabby toe scuba boots. We, we went into the um, archives and actually found the original tabby toe, which is much deeper. So if you go to the shops now, you'll get the real thing. Um, and that's, that was a great kind of chance to, to exploit that idea. So it, it kind of, it's all relevant. What do, you, what do you imagine this will look like um, in, as, he, as he put this together? You know, the, the ephemerality of, of fashion, the, the, the ephemerality of creativity in fashion is something that I've always found a little bit um, frustrating, you know, that, that these things exist for such a short time. How is your attitude, has your attitude to that changed at all, that, that the sort of fleeting nature of what you do, um, uh, that, that, that has become something that that people talk about a lot now, design well, is trapped by this. Do you feel freed from that? Um, I think I mentioned earlier my perspective on the whole industry 
has, the industry hasn't changed. I mean, the deadlines are the same, show de deadlines, production. But my perspective on it has changed. Um, and it is about trying to find a balance, um, which is really important. And you found one? Uh, it's, you know, yeah, every day I, I try. I try. I liked you talking about walking to work, and you, talk, you talked about leaving, making that, making that, that, that walk a way a to... A mental and physical yeah, way just, of just leaving get rid of things getting rid behind. Of things, yeah, it's, things behind. it's like 10, 15-minute yeah. walk, which I can do with my dog, Gypsy. And um, it is good to just cleanse, so when you get home, that's it. It's left outside. Um, There are moments when I can't leave it outside, but it's not as bad as it used to be, where I was just living it all the time, and that was quite tiring, quite exhausting. I get the feeling yeah. that, that, that your sense of what's valuable in life has changed. That, yes. That <laughs> yes. You bet. <laughs> uh, yeah. That you know what's important. It took me a while to work it out, but yeah. Yeah. But this is, this is a, that you're expressing that in this work here, that there's a, a contentment. Would that be right? Well, I, I'm, I'm happy to hear that you see a joy. And yeah, there is a joy, and you can see when um, there's a joy. Are you aware of everything that's happening in fashion, you know, everywhere else, that you're aware of how different this voice sounds in, in the context of what we see in fashion now? The joy, the, the I'm exhilaration? A, I mean, I'm, I'm aware of what... I'm not quite sure what... What you mean? Well, I, I, the, 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 this, your voice in, when, say, when you see 20 shows in Paris, right. Maison Margiela now just has this incredible exuberance. Right. And it's exhilarating. Right. And it's authentic. I think it's yes. authentic. I mean, do you yeah. have to see 20 shows a day? Do I? I don't. But, but I, I have to see 20 shows. Make a choice, no? <laughs> <laughs> just the one. <laughs> Um, no, there, there is a sense of uplift and um, well, an, that's, as an antidote. Well, I'm, I'm happy that if you feel that, I'm, I mean, it's done with joy, it's done with passion. Um, that's what drives us all. So if you feel that, that's great. That's, that's a great emotion. Um, it's great that you can come to a show like that and walk away with that emotion because so many people will go to shows with um, almost like a, a preordained emotion because it comes from a memory of having to do like 40 shows a day. And you're like, oh, not another one. <laughs> um, and that's a good place to be, I think, in your head. I think that's a really good place to be. I also love the fact that you work with the same team of people. And I think that so. that, that is... <laughs> Yeah, that is that's amazing. being so important as well yeah. in creating this, this well, when I, community. Yeah. Like it's what I wanted to do when I talked to Renzo, Renzo Rosso. Um, I wanted to do it a little bit more on my own terms. And if I was to come back, I wanted to do it with people that I trusted and people that... You know, you develop... When you work with someone 25 years, um, you do develop a shorthand, and sometimes you don't even have to speak in a fitting. They just know from your body language that, son of a bitch, it's not working, you know, and, and, and they'll try and fix it, or they can just feel it. Or when you talk about uh, or ask for a certain piece of music to be put on, they know that I need that piece of music at the moment because I'm about to cut a frill, and I need the passion or the beat, the heartbeat, to, to cut it in a certain way not in a generic, regular way, but I might want to hear a tango and feel it, and that's expressed in the way we cut the frill. <laughs> Do you feel so like yeah, it's a luxury to work with people and a team that has grown with you, um, for, sh for sure. For the sure. way you talk about it then, you know, where, you, where you're, you know, you've got the mind. tango playing and your hands are... I've got Joan Baez in my head at the moment. What, Joan Baez? Joan ba yes, Joan Which Baez. One? Which song? Um, uh, uh, Love is a four-letter word. Oh, <laughs> as long as it's not the ballad of Joe Hill. Um, it, it, when you talk about it, it feels to me like, it, it's like listening to an artist describe oh, the work. I'm you know, a dressmaker. Um, yes, I wanted to say, what do you call, you, what do you call yourself? A fashion designer. <laughs> no, you said... <laughs> 
You said... <laughs> Timothy! <laughs> you said dressmaker. I really like yeah, that. Yeah, I can... I make dresses. Um, um, <laughs> yeah. John Galliano, dressmaker. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you.